and welcome back. Now, having finished the worst songs of the miserable year, that was 2016, I had a lot of people ask me, God, it was such a terrible year, not just in general, but for pop music specifically, is there even going to be a best list? It's a fair question. 2016 was absolutely not a good year for pop music, especially in the summer, which is when we're supposed to get all the most memorable, inescapable mega smashes. Instead, we got Lucas Graham and Zayn. It was rough. But more than that, it was bleak. It is by far the darkest, saddest time in pop music I can remember. It's easy to say this in hindsight, but it almost feels like people knew what was coming. I mean, listen to these songs. Now we're stressed out. All I know are sad songs. Look what you've done. One more dance before I go. Historians are gonna have a field day studying the music of 2016. And weirdly, as the world went further and further down the toilet, I actually started enjoying the songs of the year more and more. Maybe I just caught up with the zeitgeist, but as we move into 2017, I'm actually feeling a lot better about the direction of music. It's the one part of the year that ended better than it started. You know what? You're probably not going to agree with everything on this list. But that's okay. Remember, it's just my opinion. And you know what they say, opinions are like assholes, everyone has one. And mine is demonstrably superior to yours. To the list! The top 10 best hit songs of 2016. Number 10. Look at the stars. I have a complicated relationship with Coldplay. As in, I really, really hated them from the very first time I heard them. Pretty much everything from their first three albums I think is unlistenable crap. I hated their boring music, which always sounded like a single repetitive loop played too slow. I hated their stupid, meaningless lyrics. I hated Chris Martin's stupid, whiny voice. I drew a line for you. It was a yellow line. It was a yellow line. Weirdly, it was about the time that the public kind of got sick of them that they started making music I liked. They had their last real smash around 2008, but that was the first time I really liked them. And despite them never coming close to their commercial peak in the early mid-2000s, they managed to stick around, and I've consistently been glad whenever I hear them. Even when they headlined the Super Bowl halftime show and got completely embarrassed by the guest stars and were treated like jokes by everyone, am I the only one who actually liked their performance? I like this song. No one's ever called Coldplay exciting, but more and more I find their music just pumps me up. And Adventure and an Adventure of a Lifetime is the most up-tempo song of theirs to date, with that looping guitar riff and I'm I'm sorry, I had not watched the video for this. Uh, this is huh. Uh, I think they're trying to make this Coldplay song The Monolith from 2001, which... Okay, the song's not that good, guys. Turn your magic on, let me see it say. I, I, I don't know what they're doing here. This is just distracting. Get the damn dirty apes off my screen. But yeah, I like it. I've, I've always had a soft spot for rock bands adding a disco groove to their music, no matter how clumsy. It's the kind of thing that Maroon 5 used to do well. But with the guts that Maroon 5 haven't had for about eight years now, wouldn't call it exactly the adventure of a lifetime, but it's the kind of song I'd much rather have than whatever shitfest Adam Levine is putting out lately. I mean, can you feel that? So yeah, I've come around to Coldplay. I never thought they deserved to be this kind of huge, conquering superstar band, but every time they creep back into our lives, I'm always happy to have them around. Oh, except for Paradise. That song also blows. Screw that song. Number 7. 
number nine. Speaking of acts, it took me a long time to come around on. I've been pretty clear in the past that I've just never been a Beyonce fan. And honestly, because of a lot of the same reasons that most people like her. I mean, she's glorious. She's untouchable. She's Queen Bee. She hadn't had a real radio hit in years. Not because she's unsuccessful, but because she's outgrown the need for hits. She's just so far from human that I've never been able to really feel it. And I also never really liked her man bashing songs. Not because I'm like offended as a guy, just because it always seemed so easy. It was like watching an overhyped WWE star knock out jobbers and nobodies night after night. But in 2016, I was finally, finally forced to acknowledge her greatness. Because Beyonce was finally able to test her skills against a worthy opponent. And boy did she deliver. I was the last holdout. I give up. I pledge fealty, my queen. Please don't destroy me. I actually don't think Sorry is much of a single, but Beyonce hadn't really been a singles artist in a long time. In the context of the album, which I love for the record, Sorry kills. For those who don't know, Beyonce is one of the most private celebrities on the planet. She rarely gives interviews, she shows nothing. So Jaws started hitting floors when she released an entire concept album about her husband cheating on her. Whether this is a thing that actually happened, we may never know. Could just be made up. But it sure sounded real. He only want me when I'm not there. He better call Becky with the good hair. There was speculation for months about who Becky with the good hair was. Rihanna? Kate Middleton? Holly Holm? I, I think she has good hair. I ain't thinking about you. But I don't really care. The point is, her husband is Jay-Z. Jay-Z is not replaceable. She could not have another him in a minute. So when she throws a middle finger up to him and tells him she's not sorry and she's not thinking about him, that's a big deal. I mean, I'm thinking about Jay-Z most of the time. I mean, what is he doing? How is he spending his money? Are him and Kanye still on good terms? Now you wanna say you sorry. Now you wanna call me crying. For his own wife to say this to him and to the entire world, it packs so much more punch than when it's just nameless douchebag. If there was any doubt before, there is none now. Do not fuck with Beyonce. Better call Becky with the good hair. Number eight. Are we all starting to get kind of sick of Drake? I mean, I still like him. And one of Drake's most admirable qualities is that he makes songs that are soft as hell, and yet somehow has never let it affect his swagger. The best line in his hardest song was about how soft he is. And the fact is, he makes moody R&B songs because that's what he's good at. But 2016 seemed to be a tipping point. He certainly seems to be tiring people out now by basically doing the same thing over and over again for his entire career. Even I found it hard to ignore the reeking egotism of his angsty songs lately. But you know what always helps with that? Bringing in Rihanna to cut him down. I'm too good to you. I'm way too good to you. You take my love for granted. I just don't understand it all. Oh, I'm too good to you. Too Good is a song about two people who both feel unappreciated. I don't know how to talk to you. I don't know how to ask you if you're okay. I like that. I've always liked songs like that because with every breakup song, there's always this niggling thought in the back of my mind like, yeah, that's that's your point of view, but I don't want to take sides here. I need to hear her slash his side of the story before I make any judgments. This is a really stupid way to listen to music for the record. I just want to hear both sides. I 
get you're upset, but what about what he went through? I, mean, I can't jump to conclusions here. I don't know how to talk to you. Too Good is kind of brilliant for being a song about a mutually unhappy couple. Last night, I think I lost my patience. Last I feel like I have the full picture here. And you can see that, like it so often is, it's, it's no one's fault. The couple is just suffering a level of miscommunication that it's totally Drake's fault. <laughs> I mean, there's no lyric or anything, but uh, let's be real, it's Drake's fault. Seems like they're just happier than us these days. I like to think of it as a sequel to Take Care, where we find out what happens when Drake actually does try to take care of a clearly uninterested Rihanna. But yeah, I totally buy the two of them as a couple about to break up. Which is funny, because they have great chemistry together as performers. Drake certainly does better work with Rihanna than he does with anyone else, especially Future. I've even come around on work. Hey, maybe that's what this song's about. But why don't these two know how to talk to each other? Obviously, because relationships are a lot of. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, anyway, next song. Number seven. There was this one song that came out in 2015 that I was really rooting for. I was like, please, please become a hit, and it just never did. But then 2016 came around, and suddenly it started picking up, and then by the summer, it was everywhere. And I couldn't stand it. And now at the end of the year, it's on the list anyway. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you, I'm fickle. This is former Jonas brother Joe Jonas's band, DNCE, which, I'm, I'm sorry, that says dunce. I know it's an obvious joke, but seriously, it says dunce. Is that intentional? How do you, how do you not notice that? <sighs> May as well give yourself a name that abbreviates to a curse word, like tits or something. Lame. Now, even though Joe Jonas, aka the good Jonas, is not as embarrassing as his solo act brother, there's still kind of the same stink of desperate attention seeking here. Not just because Cake by the Ocean is the clumsiest of sex metaphors. Okay, if Cake by the Ocean is sex, the hard candy is... what? Dinner in a movie? Dry humping? But also it's one of the few songs where the edited version is actually better. Cursing is so gratuitous. You're fucking delicious. Makes the band sound like unclever ten-year-olds. Like they're trying to dirty up a clean song. It's like Kids Bop in Bizarro World. Oh, come on. Who even remembers Puff Daddy dated Naomi Campbell? How much is Puff Daddy paying people for these name drops? I know nobody's throwing them into these songs because they want to. Talk to me, talk to me, baby. Basically, Cake by the Ocean is Uptown Funk if LMFAO wrote it. That's not a compliment, obviously, but it's not necessarily a criticism either. Everyone should try their hand at Uptown Funk, I say. But I'm, I'm just going to pretend it's not trying to be adult or anything. That It's just literally about Cake by the Ocean. It's honestly more dignified that way. Mm-mm. Tastes like sand. Number six. At the time, the Michael Jackson album Bad was considered a huge letdown compared with Thriller. In hindsight, that was probably unfair. Bad is actually a really good album, maybe even better than Thriller, but Thriller had so much hype that literally anything would have looked like a letdown. I kind of feel the same way about 25, Adele's follow-up to her humongous breakthrough album. First, I thought it was a letdown. On re-listen, I actually really like it. I wish this wasn't a big hit from it, though. It's annoying. And I can't tell if it's supposed to sound this sarcastic. Also, I keep getting confused with her other songs and calling it Set Fire to Your New Lover. Which would probably be a better song. No, if you ask me, this was the highlight of the album. Let me photograph you in this light In case it is the last time That we might be exactly like we were Before we realized 
21 was an album about breaking up, 25 is an album about moving on. God, this reminds me of when we were Ultimately, I didn't like Hello because it felt like a retread of Someone Like You, but now that I think about it, it makes perfect sense. Someone Like You ends 21, Hello begins 25, but When We're Young is a song where peace is finally made. It was just like a movie. It was just like a song. Was it? Was it now? You released a whole album about it and it does not seem that rosy. It was just like a song. It was just like a platinum selling album where I trash you for 48 straight minutes. Can I have a moment before I go? If I have one complaint about this song, it's that it makes me feel really old. We're sad of getting old that made us restless. Which is also probably the reason why it resonates with me so much. Need I remind you, this song is about being 25. Adele is three years younger than Carly Rae Jepsen. Of course, who am I to complain? I started feeling old at age 17. Just like everyone, right? That's right, right? Right? Yeah, whatever. Adele is still great. When we were young. You've reached the end of side A. Please turn the record over to side two.